Hey y'all, welcome to the Cali Traffic School Podcast. I am your host, Chris Pope. In today's episode, I thought we would dive in. Um, you know, I get questions and, and see people talking sometimes about koi dogs or, um, you know, hybridization with coyotes and wolves or dogs or, um, you know, and there's questions about, and myself included, you know, uh, about black coyotes and, and there's a lot of hearsay on, you know, how that is, what influences that. So I, I thought I would try to dig in and, and um, find some research and kind of see what um, if I could find anything specifically on you know coyote, koi dogs, coyote hybridization, things like that. So um, one side note, I've got I had another mic set up here. Um, I get I get a little bit I've gotten a, a little bit of feedback about my podcast episodes being the audio specifically um, being the, the volume too low um, and so I'm trying I got another um, this is I've, I've been using a, a lapel mic um, I've that's the second mic that I've used with the camera and then now I've got uh, another kind of separate microphone that's just recording audio so I'm trying to improve that audio and I thought I had you know I've, I've taken where I've pulled the audio out of the video amplified that and then produced that um, thinking that that would help the, the sound volume so give me a little feedback if you're having trouble I, I, I went and listened to some of the podcasts um, through the podcast player that I used and I didn't have any trouble listening to it but I don't listen on different platforms and I don't know how it operates on different platforms so um, if you're having any issues hearing or with the volume of the podcast or anything like that shoot me an email chris at codytrappingschool.com and, and let me know because I, I definitely want that feedback um, I want to make sure what I'm what I'm putting out for y'all is, is good quality content because I hate listening to crummy um, crummy produced content so I want to I want I want it to be good and you not be grudging about listening to it so all right back into the koi dog scenario so um, it's kind of weird when when you start digging into the research because you get it's almost you get some kind of conflicting information um, one thing I will say is there's a pretty interesting um, documentary from it's a PBS documentary on it's, it's called meeting the koi wolf and it's um, It's on Amazon. I watched it on Amazon Prime, but it's uh, like I said, it's a PBS documentary, so you may have seen it or maybe able to access it on PBS. But it's it must be produced by uh, a Canadian um, bunch because it it's primarily around. Well, I guess maybe it, they they deal a lot with uh, coyotes and wolf hybridization in Algonquin Park, which is in Canada, uh, and then they also deal a little bit with the. Uh, urban couch around Toronto and they also talk about Chicago and some other areas but uh, it may just be with that because um, you know kind of their what they laid out there was um, and, and from 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 that research they talked about there doesn't seem to be much hybridization with the gray wolf uh, and the coyote but with the eastern I think it's the eastern gray wolf, eastern wolf. Um, there has and there is hybridization going on there, and really the the way that that is known is with um, Algonquin Park in Canada is one of the the last places where you know the, the eastern wolves have been protected, and so that's kind of one of the last areas where they exist, and um, then with the, the expanding. Um, range of coyotes and one of the things that several of these papers talked about is that you know typically you don't see hybridization in, in two animals that kind of may be in close proximity unless one of those populations is very low and so that's kind of the speculation with the koi wolf if you, if you will um, in those northern areas is that you know, in that Algonquin Park area um, the eastern wolf population 
got so low just through so much pressure and and um, you know trying to control that population that there were so at one time there were so few gray wolves and kind of isolated to that Algonquin Park area and then as coyotes expanded and they came in there were so few uh, presumably potential mates for those gray wolves that they saw the coyotes as a um, suitable suitor I guess I don't know what other way to put it but um, so and they talk about that in some of the the coyotes that they collared and, and tracked around Toronto that just some of the traits and genetically they have common characteristics of those gray wolves and, and or the eastern wolf excuse me and so um, that's one thing that they were tracking that they did say that you know when looking and tracking some coyotes in Chicago in urban and downtown Chicago they didn't have those same traits and DNA characteristics as the, the eastern wolf so you know it's specific to that area and kind of um, the coyotes that have have hybridized with those wolves and then expanded into other areas you know as, as they expand I guess southward and eastward so that doesn't really apply to our southern coyotes southeastern coyotes and so just just looking um, and and like I say here's one paper that I wasn't able to read the whole paper but I could read the abstract and so if you're if you're ever interested in kind of delving into the scientific rabbit hole I guess that you could say um, you can go just go to Google Scholar and you can just Google Google Scholar and it'll pop up and if you go through there specifically you can um, it, it acts just like Google but it only searches these scientifically produced research papers and peer-reviewed articles and journals and um, so that's a that's a really neat and easy way to kind of access some of this high-level research data the only problem is some of it is behind uh, paywalls and some of these journals you don't have access unless you buy a subscription or something like that so um, you can most of them you can still access the abstract which is just a, um, a really shortened down kind of to the point this is what this art this is what this article is about this is what we found and then uh, a lot of times that's all you need because unless you're just looking for something to help you go to sleep these research articles are not the most exciting things to read they're written in you know research lingo and they're just boring as heck to read um, but this is one it's a uh, called genetic characterization of eastern coyotes in eastern Massachusetts it's published in June of 2010 and like I said I can only get the abstract on this one um, but it said they uh, genetically examined 67 coyotes in eastern Massachusetts and so they said there was no evidence of either domestic dog or gray wolf mitochondrial DNA in these animals these results indicate that the eastern coyote should more so let's see let me let me go back a little bit farther so this is gonna be kind of weird wording but structure analysis and factorial correspondence analysis of the micro satellite genotypes indicated that the eastern coyote in Massachusetts clustered with other northeastern canis populations and away from western coyotes eastern wolves and gray wolves they contained mitochondria haplotypes this is all the stuff that I'm telling you unless you're just looking for something to put you to sleep it's not the exciting read they contain mitochondrial mitochondrial haplotypes from both eastern coyotes and from both western coyotes and eastern wolves consistent with their hybrid origin from those two species so there it goes into there was no evidence of either domestic dog or gray wolf mitochondrial DNA in these animals uh, these results indicate that the eastern coyote should more appropriately be termed koi wolf to reflect their hybrid and they list the scientific names their hybrid origin which is uh, Canis latrans, which is the coyote, and Canis ly lycaon, which is the eastern wolf. So that kind of says that what I was just talking about—that you're, you know, some of these eastern, some of the coyotes, 
you know, the eastern coyotes tend to be larger, than, a little bit larger than the western coyotes. And uh, so some of the evidence may point to a hybridization with eastern wolves. And that was one thing that I, I didn't mention in the, the documentary. They talk about the, the pop coyote population in Chicago. And those are also bigger, have larger, I guess, size characteristics than the western coyotes do, but they don't have that eastern, uh, eastern wolf DNA in them. So somehow they have kind of adapted to, to being larger um, without the, the wolf genetics intertwined there. Um, so another paper that was talking specifically about coyotes in the in the southeastern US and it's um it's a little bit weird you, again you get kind of conflicting um, conflicting information and and I, I guess it's not conflicting but they're just putting out almost kind of two hypotheses. So in the abstract, this, this is a short paper titled Widespread Occurrence of a Domestic Dog Mitochondrial DNA Haplotype in Southeastern U.S. Coyotes. I'm trying not to bore y'all. I'm trying to, uh, I'm hoping this is interesting, but some of the, the wording is definitely not. One interesting note that this, this points out, um, so I, I'll, I'll follow up with that in a minute, but this, this abstract says the widespread distribution this haplotype, which is um, domestic dog in coyotes, Wide dis widespread distribution of this haplotype from Florida to West Virginia suggests that the hybridization event occurred long ago before the southeastern USA was colonized by coyotes. However, it could have occurred in the southeastern USA before the main front of coyotes arrived in the area between male coyotes released for sport and a local domestic dog. So this is kind of an interesting, interesting take. Um, and one, one thing to note is that um, apparently, I guess research has kind of sussed this out, but um, this is, these results demonstrate that a male coyote hybridized with a female dog and a female hybrid offspring successfully integrated into the coyote population. So, you know, as you know, some hybridizations produce sterile animals or um, animals that may not be fit to survive. And so that's interesting that, you know, kind of pointing out that it, it has to be, you know, just a certain um, setup for these animals, you know, a, a hybrid, a, a pup to, uh, to be viable. And I, I can't remember which one it was in, but it talked about the, um, with dog, domestic dog bred into the coyotes, they found that that called, if it was a female, I think if it was a female, she came into heat and was ready to breed in December versus February, which is typical for coyotes. So in a lot of areas that produces a, a uh, pup or a litter before really went in, in the north before winter is all the way out. And so that may make them you know, less likely for that litter to survive if she does produce a viable litter. But you get into the south down here, you know, where we can have 70 and 80 degree days all through winter, and, you know, winter is done mostly by the end of February, a lot anyways, are in the harshest conditions. Um, you know, that having that pupping a little bit early does not make that much of a difference. So that can, that can also play in. Um, So here's another, um, Eastern Canadian wolves and coyotes are able to interbreed and produce viable offspring and hybrid offspring have been incorporated into the wild paternal population. So there again, that, that speaks to the, the information about the, the Eastern wolf and coyote hybridization and how that is um, a potential. And let's see. This, I got this paper that discusses a little bit of the a little bit of the, the melanistic traits or talking about um, black coyotes 
but there's so there's there's kind of two camps here, and I don't see anybody that's super definitive. But there's the camp that some of these domestic dog traits that are showing in coyotes occurred thousands of years ago, um, possibly. So in this paper, it actually says that. Um, domestic dog because domestic dogs came from wolves right presumably some kind of wild canid and um, it could have been so however if this particular genotype arose in old world wolves before domestication our data indicates that it must have been lost from the gene pool and reacquired in North America perhaps from Native American dogs that accompanied humans across the Bering Strait, uh, which supposedly was 12 to 14,000 years ago. So they're saying that even if there was a link between domestic dogs and wild wolves thousands of years ago, tens of thousands of years ago, that apparently somehow it was lost, but then for the North American wolf or canid population anyways, um, somehow that domestic dog gene or line got linked back in um, possibly when people were first coming to the North American continent um, I was thinking of somewhere else I was going with that but anyway so there's that camp that um, you know the only reason that the domestic dog genetics are showing up in coyotes and potentially wolves is that um, you know thousands of years ago you know they were all one species anyway and you know as they um, as people kind of bred and evolved it out you, you kind of got a separation there um, but this this other paper that talks about um, southeastern coyotes does bring up and I I think it may be a stretch, but it's kind of interesting to, to think about anyway. So, in uh, so here I'm taking right off. So, we observed the dog-like haplotype in relatively new populations of coyotes in southeastern USA, which were established between 1960 and 1980. So, historically, and this goes back to you know, you know pre-1900s, really, the red wolf range was across. A lot of the southeast and eastern US but as humans you know came in and expanded the red wolves weren't quite as adaptable as coyotes and uh, so you know they were realistically and they were listed as extinct um, in let's see I wrote it down I think it was 1986 1980 red wolves were declared extinct in the wild uh, there was in 1961 there was only a small population in uh, South Louisiana and maybe Texas that was kind of isolated to the marsh areas where you know they weren't competing for farmland or, or ag livestock or anything like that so they were kind of left alone um, so here's let's see So according to some of the red wolf research, and again, some of that's kind of spotty, um, they say that the, the red wolf and the eastern, eastern Canada wolf share similarities with coyotes but diverged thousands of years ago. Um, so it's not likely that there's been any recent influence on coyotes by red wolves. Um, A, because you know, as the, the coyote population has expanded in the southeast, Red wolves haven't been around in the southeast, so you know that's one thing that, and, and it's kind of weird because you can tell into a whole another rabbit hole starting to research red wolves, and you know there's a lot of speculation and that you know, red wolves are a hybrid of a coyote and a uh, gray wolf, or a coyote and an eastern wolf, or um, that's a, that's a whole another rabbit hole. But they've been declared um, at least a, a, a wolf subspecies, and. Um, so, but I, I hear people talk about you know larger 
coats, you know, across the southeast, and it's because they've been they've hybridized with red wolves. But personally, I don't think that is a very plausible scenario, just because of the the growth of the coyote population in the south and the lack of existence of red wolves in the south. Uh, I mean, they were declared extinct in the wild in 1980. Before that, long before that, there had been a period of very very small amount of red wolves in the wild and largely isolated to you know one small particular area of the southeast um, so personally I don't feel like there's much there's there's from the research that I've read there's not any impact or influence in the coyote population of, the, of red wolves now there is hybridization between coyotes and red wolves you know Currently, the only place that red wolves exist in the wild is in Alligator, I think it's Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, which is in coastal North Carolina. Um, and it's kind of, it's, it's connected to land, but it's kind of like a peninsula. And so they can get off, um, but they're, it's a very small population that's very closely monitored. And, uh, you know, one of the issues is they, they don't want them, from what I've read, they don't want them hybridizing or, or um, creating offspring with coyotes because they're concerned about, you know, they don't want to dilute the genetics of the, the red wolf. That being said, I think they are having issues with genetic diversity um, just because it's such a small remnant population. So that's a whole, you know, kind of side tangent. But um, so we'll get back to this. So it talks about the relatively new populations of coyotes in the, in the southeastern U.S. And he said, therefore, the hybridization event may have occurred in the population of coyotes that is ancestral to the southeastern coyotes. So the hybridization could have occurred long before coyotes ever came to the southeast. So it's not, but again, like I'm saying, like I said before, there could, one theory is that um, coyote, domestic dog influence is thousands of years ago, not anything recent. However, back to the paper, Previous studies of mitochondrial DNA in coyotes elsewhere have not found any wolf-like or dog-like haplotypes. This supports an alternative hypothesis that the introgression event occurred as the ancestral coyote populations began to colonize the southeastern U.S. So that means that there's a possibility that the hybrid, there was some hybridization as coyotes were moving into the southeast, which occurred from the 60s and 80s you know, to present day. So, coyotes dispersing along the edge of their range would encounter areas with few potential mates and hybridization with dogs may have been favored because of density effects. So like I said earlier, scientists say that you know, when you get, you rarely get hybridization unless one species is at a very low level and there's not a lot of viable um, mates, excuse me, for animals of those, that species. going on here so and this is this is kind of the interesting part to me it, it seems like a little bit of a stretch but it says finally the coyote dog cross could have taken place in the southeast through human activities before the natural range of coyotes expanded to encompass the southeastern u.s so here it's talking about people bringing coyotes in to the south to florida and other states um, for coyote pens and so bringing in and releasing coyotes for coyote pens and and that's or not for necessarily just for coyote pens, but for coyote hunting in general, running with dogs. And um, I don't know how well documented that is as you know a driver for coyote expansion into the southeast. I think coyotes have naturally expanded across the Mississippi River and into these areas on their own. But I definitely think that that gave them a, a you know ahead of time foothold in certain areas of people bringing coyotes in and, and releasing them for hound hunting. Um, and it says, going back to kind of the, the initial discussion around what, how, to, how you can create a viable koi dog hybrid, if you will, is it requires a male coyote and a female dog. And then it talks in here, and it's, I don't know if conjecture is the right word, but it's kind of assumption more so than anything else I guess is a good way to say it but um, it says talking about the basically the live market the 
live market cap, which is exactly what they're talking about. It says, additionally, dispersing juvenile males are much more abundant in this trade because they're easier to capture and trap. Um, so coyotes were released into areas which previously had no coyotes and they escaped. Some releases may have occurred in the northwestern Florida, Panhandle, southern Alabama. Um, these predominantly male released individuals may have been the first coyotes in many areas, thus lacking female counterparts. In this situation, one male coyote may have mated with a single female dog. So you get that opportunity for just the right setup of male coyotes that were caught because dispersing males may be more apt to be trapped and you require a male coyote and a female dog to get a, a viable hybrid. Um, and so, and you've got to have a female hybrid offspring. So the female hybrid offspring may have been accepted by male coyotes because there were no female coyotes available. The descendants of this cross may have expanded their range in the southeastern USA with or without the assistance of dealers before or live market people before coyotes naturally expanded into these areas. Uh, once coyotes naturally expanded into these areas, the hybrid phenotypes were diluted through back crossing of the mitochondrial DNA lineage remained. Release of coyotes from Texas into Florida were documented as recently as the late 90s marked by an outbreak of a Texas strain of coyote rabies in the Gainesville, Florida area. So just kind of wrap it up and says our data show that hybridization occurred between a female dog and a male coyote and that at least one of the female offspring of that cross successfully integrated into the coyote population. Considering the diverse current diversity of dog and coyote haplotypes and that only a single dog haplotype was found, the hybridization the hybridization event probably involved one or a few females and is not evidence of ongoing hybridization. So that seems kind of like a stretch to say that um, because there's there's some data in here of some trap or some some coyotes that they they uh, they looked at their DNA and there's some from Florida, there's some from North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, and so to me that seems like a stretch that you know one coyote in Florida bred a dog and then they they spread that. Not to say that it couldn't be, because coyotes can range and all, and I'm sure there's, you know, some live market opportunities in, uh, you know, I know there is in North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia. I'm sure there is too some houndsman opportunities. So, um, but I guess because of you know the expanding expanded coyote population, you don't have the, I guess probably rarely do you have a true coy dog scenario. Um, just because there are plenty of coyotes to go around now, and so they're not in as hard up for you know a mate um, to, to try to take a domestic dog. I hope that made sense. I hope that wasn't a lot of rambling and kind of uh, research mumbo jumbo. It kind of felt like it, but I guess the overall the takeaway for me anyway is that there's not a bunch, not a bunch of koi dogs, not a bunch of coyotes running around breeding a bunch of female. Um, dogs or vice versa it, absolutely there's plenty of opportunity especially with the, the amount of urban coyotes now and, and uh, but I don't I don't think that's happening that often um, just my personal opinion you can take that for what it's worth um, one interesting thing article that I read um, and it's it centered around gray wolf so it's the molecular and evolutionary history of melanism in North American gray wolves and it, this kind of tied in and, and really um, I think it's, it's very interesting um, it's, it's they, they studied gray wolves and looked at the populations of several kind of distinct populations so you've got some Canadian um, and Alaska I think two gray wolves that live just on the tundra so non-forested areas and the majority, the vast majority of those wolves are a consistent you know, gray color that you think of when you think coyotes are wolves. But in Alaska, when you get farther south and you get wolves that live in and around the forested areas and there is a higher prevalence of melanistic or black or uh, this specifically talks about melanism and black color fades, but you know, we see 
there are other color phases too. And so in the abstract here, just cutting right to the chase, it says we show that the melanistic locust mutation in North American wolves derives from past hybridization with domestic dogs, has risen to high frequency in forested habitats, and exhibits a molecular signature of positive selection. So this is the paper that, that goes into the the idea that, you know, the hybridization of or the existence, I guess, of the domestic dog DNA within you know, wolves and presumably coyotes as well among, I guess you could say, the North American canid population, um, canine population, occurred thousands of years ago, not something that happened recently. And uh, the one thing they note is that the only areas, and I'm not, honestly, I couldn't tell you where all um, where all wolves are found, but the only areas that apparently they see this, um, you see the, the melanistic or the black color phase wolves are in North America and in, in Italy. Um, uh, up, I can't remember which, what they call their Italian wolves or something like that. Um, but the, the gist of, of this paper is that um, there's definitely dog DNA in wolves and in coyotes as well, I would venture to say. And they talk about coyotes in here too. So uh, the pattern of haplotype diversity for all three canids, which is um, dogs, coyotes, and wolves. So the pattern of haplotype diversity for all three canids was similar to that observed in wolves alone and showed significantly less diversity relative to other chromosomes. So of the 15 unique KB haplotypes, one haplotype was observed in three coyotes and six dogs, and a second haplotype was observed in two coyotes and 12 wolves. However, none of the 66 haplotypes were observed in more than one species. That didn't really, that didn't really, wasn't really what I was looking for. Regardless, it, it talks, in, in here it talks about the the, I guess the color phase that is found in coyotes and wolves is directly related to presumably thousands of years ago hybridization and interaction with dogs and some of the dog DNA that may be still found in coyotes and wolves. But one of the things that it kind of points out, highlights, is that It's environmental factors, I guess, that are kind of selecting for those color phases. So when you see the Canadian Arctic wolves that only hunt on the tundra, they are an all gray colored coat. Yet when you see the Alaskan wolves that hunt in the forest as well, you see a lot more um, color phase, black color phase, and other color phase, specifically I guess black color phase, because apparently it would presume that there is some advantage, or perceived, not perceived, but some advantage to having that darker color and maybe camouflage and working in, in the forest versus the gray color. And so it kind of, it registered to me in my mind too that you think about, or the way I thought about it was, you know, I feel personally like we see a lot more color phase variation in coyotes in the southeast where I'm from than you do in some of your western coyotes, you know, your Wyoming, Montana, Dakota's coyotes. And if you think about it from this aspect, a lot of those coyotes, you're, you're talking prairie regions, you're not talking forested areas. And so, you know, you see a lot more consistency, a lot more of the gray, you know, kind of traditional color phase animals in those areas, whereas you get down in the south and we're gonna see black coats, red coats, yellow coats, I mean, just all kinds of different color phases um, that probably aren't so much linked to recent breeding with domestic dogs, but it is a trait that is coach have inherited throughout the generations from domestic dogs, 
but maybe or presumably is selected for because of our changed in our different environment. Um, so you know more for you know the southeast is all forested primarily, very you know just small patches you know farmland and cropland overall just small patches of of kind of prairie plains type ground. So um, maybe it behooves is is more beneficial for those coyotes to be uh, darker color and you know maybe that is a um, kind of an adaptation almost in in um, helping them to be more successful in that environment. So I hope that was not too much rambling and, and, and going on. I, I, the, the takeaway for me again there is there is some dog DNA traits in coyotes and wolves. I don't personally believe there's a lot of coy dogs running around. There definitely is the potential for that, um, but I think it's probably very small and very isolated. Um, and the black color phase of coyotes and, and the different color phases of coyotes that we see, especially in the southeast, probably does have to do with some of that um, long existent, long-standing domestic dog DNA that is in the coyotes, but it may be being brought out because of the environment, not necessarily because that coyote made it with a German Shepherd last you know, season. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I, I, I hope that is valuable. I hope that, you know, like I said, that you, you hear people talk about coy dogs and, and stuff, and maybe I hear it more than, or maybe I think I hear it more than I really do, but uh, it's just something that you hear a lot of speculation about it. So I, I wanted to go, you know, try to go to some research and, and look some of that up and see you know, really where that shakes out and if that is true. And uh, so I feel I feel fairly confident that you know this research indicates that, like I said, there's no there's not a bunch of koi dogs running around out in the landscape. Absolutely, you know, there's always outliers and there definitely is a potential. Um, but odds are it's a true coyote um, that for some reason has some specific color phase that was selected for some unknown reason in, you know, his um, genetics at that time and in that environment. So, there you have it. What makes a black coat a black coat, I guess, is the, the simple way to sum it up. And uh, so now you know, at least you know, my thoughts and my opinions based on reading some research papers. And I'll try to link to all these papers in the description. Um, just so, like I said, if you're itching for something to really put you to sleep, you can just really dive in and, and check these out. <laughs> Otherwise, y'all have a good season. I hope you're out catching some black coyotes, and now you know why they're black. We'll catch you later. Hey y'all, I want to be sure everybody's aware of my new Trappers Academy that I have rolled out. Um, it's taking place of the old Coyote Trapping 101 course. Um, I'm rebranding as the Trappers Academy, uh, not Coyote Trapping School, but just this um, membership, this course. Um, try to make it all inclusive, comprehensive, of uh, particularly geared towards new trappers. You know, if you're if you're new to trapping and want to learn not just about coyotes, but about beavers, otters, raccoons, anything trapping related and, and getting started, um, kind of a start to finish uh, setup, then this is this is the place. Um, I'm adding, I'm currently adding existing content, so I've got several um, species built out, and we'll be adding more through this trapping season. So if you are a member, I'm definitely if you got something that you don't see and you want to see, that's something um, I will be building out in the future and you know the more feedback I get the the more it's going to be tailored and, and hopefully the better it's going to be for for you the member um, so if you're interested in that go to coyotetrappingschool.com slash trappers academy trappers s with an s academy and uh, you can learn more about it there but I'm, I'm excited about that not only is it going to be uh, hours and hours of video content broken down into short segments um, and, and uh, I guess arranged by title or specific sets and you know it, it'll be very simple and easy you won't have to watch an hour of video to get to you know the, the video or the content the specific thing that you're looking for you can click 
and you know watch a five or ten minute video specifically on that topic um, and then you know scroll around as needed and watch videos as needed there will also be a twice monthly live question and answer call so if you're a member and you've got questions you've got you know issues that you're having on your trap line um, call in and I'll give you answers you know right there on the spot all in an attempt to help folks get started trapping um, give it you know kind of a leg up and speed things up and uh, helps to make you a better trapper helps to make me a better trapper as well so again go check out coyotetrappingschool.com slash trappers academy to learn more about that thank y'all for listening